Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the second uh, plenary address, keynote address for the evening, um, capping off a marvelous day of wonderful conversation and presentations. Uh, we're delighted to welcome two close friends of the DeNicola Center this evening, uh, Professor Elizabeth Schultz and Dr. Mary O'Callaghan. Elizabeth Schultz is the Herrick Professor of Law and the Thomas J. Abood Research Scholar at the University of St. Thomas School of Law in Minnesota. A graduate of Yale and Columbia Law School where she served on the Columbia Law Review, she was in private practice for nine years with law firms in Washington, D.C. and Minneapolis, as well as a member of the faculty of the Notre Dame Law School from 1996 until the year 2000. In 2001, she became one of the founding faculty uh, of the University of St. Thomas Law School. She's received numerous awards at the School of Law, including Dean's Award for Outstanding Scholarship, several mission awards for scholarly engagement and societal reform, and the Dean's Award for Outstanding Teaching. Professor Schultz's research and interests include disability rights, consumer law, and feminist legal theory. She serves on the boards of directors of the National Catholic Partnership on Disability and L'Arche USA, and is a contributor to the Catholic legal theory blog, Mirror of Justice, with several of our wonderful Notre Dame colleagues, including Rick Garnett, one of the co-founders of that. Uh, Professor Schultz is a 1998 graduate of Partners in Policymaking Academy, a nationwide state-based training program for disability advocacy. And this past spring, she established a special education clinic at St. Thomas Law School to help underserved parents and children negotiate special education services. The response will be by Dr. Mary O'Callaghan, a developmental psychologist and public policy fellow of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture, where her research focuses on the ethical and policy issues surrounding disability selective abortion and other issues involving disabilities. A regular faculty member at the DeNicola Center's Vita Institute, a pro-life intellectual formation program. Her policy work includes testimony before state legislatures regarding disability selective abortion bans and testimony at the United Nations on the scope of international abortion of children with Down syndrome. She has developed materials on disability for the U US Conference of Catholic Bishops, served on disability advisory boards in the Diocese of Fort Wayne, South Bend, and is co-founder of Miriam's Blessing, a local perinatal hospice organization. Dr. O'Callaghan was recently appointed a faculty fellow in the Master of Autism Studies program at St. Mary's College and is an adjunct professor in the Mendoza College of Business at Notre Dame, where she teaches statistics. Tonight, Lisa and Mary will speak on a theme that is close to both of their hearts and our hearts as well, in a discussion entitled The Utter Incoherence of the Vision of Human Dignity Underpinning Disability Law and Policy. Please welcome Professor Schultz. So I have to start by thanking the DeNicolo Center for inviting me and thanking personally everybody at the DeNicolo Center whose name I do know, Carter and Margaret and Ken, and then all the people whose names I do not know who were instrumental in doing this for all of us. And the thank you extends, I know, not just for me, but from everybody here. Isn't it great to be together again? Thank you. And I have to also say it's, it's very humbling to be here, offering my attempt at contributing to a basic insight that has been articulated by so many people who are so much smarter than I am, uh, many of whom have strong connections to Our Ladies University and, and we're speaking and are speaking at this conference. I can just name a couple of books that articulate better than I will the basic insight that I'm going to be exploring today. Alistair McIntyre's Dependent Rational Animals, Gilbert Mylander's Neither God Nor Beast, no, Neither Beast Nor God, right? Um, then some other people, Robin West, Reimagining Justice, Eva Fetter Kitte, Loves Labor, and of course, Carter Sneed, What It Means to Be Human. These are all complex, really wonderful books, and they say so much more about dignity than the little piece of it that I want to focus on today. They share a basic insight, and that insight is, is, is this. We organize our common lives together around some notion, some, some vision of who we are at core, what gives our existence dignity. And the dominant narrative of our modern post-enlightenment liberalism the common vision that shapes all of our laws 
um, and, our, and, our, and our lives together is that our dignity lies in our rationality, our autonomy, and our capacity for self-definition. But what all of those brilliant thinkers have realized and articulated is the uh, idea that that's just wrong, right? That is basically wrong. The insight of those whose great, those great thinkers on whose shoulders I am perching tonight is that in fact, what we all share most fundamentally is our vulnerability and our dependence on one another. And that, that fact has to somehow be at the core of what we understand as human dignity. The group with the most immediate stake in this critique of the rational autonomy-based vision of dignity is clearly the disability community. Those with significant intellectual disabilities, they flat out flunk that first marker of dignity, rationality. But even those who can pass that first hurdle are more likely to be keenly aware of their own vulnerability and dependency than people without disabilities. Without a doubt, we treat people with disabilities much better now than ever before in U.S. history, at least recent U.S. history. And people with disabilities in the U.S. have greater rights and protections than almost anywhere in the globe. But I'm going to argue today that our laws are not as strong as your average modern liberal human, humanist likes to think that they are. And what's more, they're seriously flawed because they are structured around this false dominant vision of human dignity. And my talk today is going to have four parts. First, I'm going to show how our most fundamental disability law, the Americans with Disabilities Act, I'm going to call that the ADA, how that is powerfully shaped by the values of autonomy. The ADA does not do as much for those whose disabilities do not allow them to achieve a certain basic level of autonomy. Second, I'm going to talk about something that's not widely discussed because it's boring and it's complicated, and more importantly, it it, it is inconsistent with those values of autonomy that shape the discourse of disability rights. The truth is the lives of people with disabilities are affected much less by the ADA than they are by the complex set of laws and policies that shape our welfare system. And that entire system is structured around being able to prove your vulnerability and your dependence. And that system is wholly inadequate, structurally incapable of fulfilling ADA's promise of autonomy. Because of that, and this is my third point, in reality, the lives of most people with disabilities are radically dependent upon the support of their families. And that hard fact is largely ignored because it is, of course, radically at odds with this value of autonomy. And because this is such an inconvenient fact, families have been left on their own to fill in all the gaps in the social service systems that support people with disabilities. And my fourth and final point is about the real dangers posed by the power of the autonomy rhetoric and disability rights discourse. There's continual pressure to enact legal reforms based on the values of autonomy at the expense of some of the most vulnerable and dependent people with disabilities. And I'm going to talk about two examples having to do with jobs and housing. Okay, so point one, the ADA. The ADA, when it was enacted in 1990, uh, was, the, was the, the, for, the fourth in a series of disability laws. The first was the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prohibited disability-based discrimination in any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. One of the most dramatic stories in the history of disability rights um, was the, 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 the story of the 1977 sit-ins and demonstrations that led to the promulgation of regulations to enact, the, um, to, 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 to enact that law, that Rehab Act of 1973. Um, they finally pressured the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to approve these regulations. And that was the occasion of the infamous Capitol Crawl, where disability rights protesters abandoned their wheelchairs at the bottom of the steps of the US Capitol building and crawled up to the top of the stairs in order to, to dramatize their struggle. In 1975, we got the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA, which guarantees students with disabilities the right to be educated in public schools. And in 1998, we got some amendments to the Fair Housing Act that prohibit discrimination in, in sale and, and rental of housing. 
but the ADA is the big kahuna of disability law. So I don't have PowerPoints, but I have one prop. This is my prop. This is the, the statutory supplement that I use when I teach disability law. In law school, typically a lot of textbooks have a textbook that has cases, a narrative, and then a statutory supplement that has the actual laws and regulations that we're gonna be learning about, okay? So this is the one I use. I just wanna show you something. All of this, these are the laws and regulations dealing with the ADA. These are the laws and regulations dealing with the Rehab Act. These are the laws and regulations with the Fair Housing Amendments. And then finally, at the end, the IDA regulations. So pay attention, because I'm gonna ask you a question about this later on. But the basic point is this, right? The ADA is really the be all and the end all here. The ADA is divided into three main titles. So let's take a closer look at them. Title three, that's probably what most of us think about when we think about the ADA. That requires the removal of architectural barriers and eligibility criteria that would prevent anyone from a with a disability from accessing public accommodations. That's what gives us braille markings on drive up ATMs and ramps and big wheelchair accessible bathroom stalls in all of our restaurants and doors with buttons that you can push to open. Those are things that uh, help all of us, right? The, the ADA was instrumental in instituting um, features of universal design that we all take advantage of, right? We all know that, those of us who have pushed a baby stroller or used our elbow to open a door when our arms are full, right? And this most visible aspect of the AB ADA also illustrates vividly the animating vision of the bulk of the advocates who pushed for its enactment. Who were those activists who were sitting in the offices of HEW and crawling up the Capitol stairs? They were mostly college students with physical disabilities. These brave and committed activists truly changed the world for the better for all people with disabilities. That is indisputable. But the law itself is clearly focused predominantly on helping those with disabilities who are realistically capable of living a fairly autonomous life. So let's look at Title I. Title I prohibits discrimination in employment for people with disabilities. It requires employers to make reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities to allow them to perform jobs for which they are otherwise qualified. This is a powerful and wonderful piece of civil rights legislation, and I am an ardent fan of what it does to prevent discrimination against qualified individuals in the workplace. But it has a very limited application to the life of many people with significant intellectual disabilities who aren't able to meet that threshold standard of being otherwise qualified to hold most jobs. Reasonable accommodations have been interpreted not to include the sorts of support that many people with intellectual disabilities need to hold a job. I'm not sure that the language of the ADA necessarily compels that stinginess, but that's how it's been interpreted. The Equal Employment Opportunity, uh, uh, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, they're the ones who write the regulations that implement this title of the ADA. And I think they sort of agree with me. In a, in a primer for small business that they've published, they include job coaches on the list of examples of types of reasonable accommodations. Uh, this is an example they give. A custodian with mental retardation might have a job coach paid for by an outside agency to initially help, on a full-time basis, the worker learn required tasks and who then, periodically thereafter, returns to help ensure he is performing the job properly. But the courts have not been generous in interpreting reasonable accommodations for people with intellectual disabilities. In 1998, a U.S. District Court in Michigan conceded that a temporary job coach providing job training to a qualified person with an intellectual disability might be a reasonable accommodation. But then the court refused to accommodate and denied relief to two people with intellectual disabilities because a full-time job coach providing more than training to an unqualified individual is not a reasonable accommodation. In 1991, a case involving a person with a physical disability, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals rejected as unreasonable an accommodation often seen in supported employment arrangements for people with intellectual disabilities. 
having two people together form a team that perform the same tasks that are normally performed by just one. So again, we see that Title I of the ADA offers limited help to people with significant intellectual disabilities. So let's look at Title II. Title II prohibits excluding a qualified person from a disability from participating in services or programs offered by a public entity. This is the section of the ADA that is most evenly applicable to all people with all sorts of disabilities. It includes really important things like access to courts and juries, like um, treatment by law enforcement officials, access to voting, and emergency preparedness plans. Indeed, this was the section of the ADA that the Supreme Court in 1999 relied on in the landmark case of Olmstead v. L.C. The court held it was illegal discrimination for a state to keep people with disabilities in institutional settings if they had been judged competent to live in community settings. Public entities must administer their services in the most integrated setting possible that's appropriate to the needs of those people. A setting that, quote, enables individuals with disabilities to interact with non-disabled persons to the fullest extent possible. This was a very important case for disability rights, and some call it the Brown versus Board of Education for disability rights. It is a potent weapon in the arsenal of legal rights for people with disabilities, an important step in the gradual desegregation of a group of people who 100 years ago would have been locked up in institutions. But all it does is tell states that they can't institutionalize people unless it's necessary. It doesn't provide or do much to actually create any alternative community-based settings to which these liberated people can move. So how do people with disabilities find these integrated living situations? This is a reality that the ADA ignores. Besides a place to live, people with disabilities often need support for what is commonly called the activities of daily living. This could be bathing, dressing, feeding yourself, doing household chores, transportation, handling money, shopping. To get that help, you have to either be able to pay for it yourself, get some support from the Medicaid system, or find somebody to do it for you for free. Paying for it yourself requires an income. Even before the pandemic, fewer than one in three working age people had jobs compared to three-fourths of their non-disabled peers. Even before the pandemic, the poverty rate for people with disabilities was two and a half times higher than the poverty rate for those without. People with disabilities lost more jobs at the beginning of the pandemic than people without, and they've been slower to get those jobs back. In October of this past year, the ARC reported that close to 40% of people with disabilities were laid off or furloughed during the pandemic. Okay, so what about Social Security? If you have a disability and you can provide that you don't have assets of over $2,000, with some exceptions, you can qualify for SSI. And that gives you currently $794 a month. That doesn't pay for a lot of rent, and it doesn't pay for a lot of assistance in the activities of daily living. So what about that federal Medicaid program? It's administered individually by every one of the states. To qualify for assistance under the Medicaid program, you have to prove you have a disability and that you don't have the resources to pay for the needed services yourself. If you can prove that, Medicaid has to pay for you to live in a nursing home where you can get the help that you need. But that's really not what most people want, right? So instead, you can apply for what's called home and community-based services, where instead of living in a nursing home, you can choose to receive your help at home from people that you choose. These programs are typically called waiver programs because states have to apply to the Federal um, Secretary of Health and Human Services, HHS, for a waiver from the restrictive guidelines of Medicaid that would apply if they were getting these services and this living support in a nursing home. They prefer, right, to give you this waiver because it, it actually ends up being cheaper and it's obviously much more pleasant for the person affected. And that sounds great, right? 
Indeed, the majority opinion in the Olmstead case, the Supreme Court um, took comfort from this, and this is a quote from that case. Since 1981, Medicaid has provided funding for state-run home and community-based care through a waiver program. Indeed, HHS has a policy of encouraging states to take advantage of the waiver program and often approves more waiver slots than a state ultimately uses. Unfortunately, that's not the reality of most waiver programs. In fact, most states have notoriously long waiting lists for people who have already qualified for the waivers to get the waivers because they don't have enough funding to provide them. A 2017 study listed these sorts of waiting lists. In my state, Minnesota, 237. In this state, Indiana, 1,404. Some of the states around us. Okay, Michigan, is it in that direction from where we are? Michigan, is that right? Michigan, Michigan. 3,233 people on the waiting list. Illinois, it's there, right? Illinois, 19,354. Ohio, 68,644. Florida, 71,016, and Texas, 281,381 people on the waiting list. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? <laughs> so even if you qualify for a waiver and you get off the waiting list, you have to find a place to live and then find people willing to do the personal assistance work that you need for the activities of daily living. Although Medicaid lets you choose your personal assistance, they control the wages that you're allowed to pay them. And the Medicaid reimbursement rates are very low, and these jobs typically come without any benefits. The lack of qualified direct support personnel has been acknowledged as a crisis in the disability community for years, and the crisis has gotten dramatically more serious during the COVID pandemic. This is difficult frontline work, caring for people who can be more susceptible to COVID infection and who might not be capable of protective act actions like wearing masks or uh, uh, engaging in social distances. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my prop now and this is time for the pop quiz. Okay, how many pages in the statutory supplement were dev devoted to the Medicaid laws and regulations? Zero, none, right? They wouldn't even fit into a book. There's wads and wads of them, and there's different ones for every single state, and there's federal ones, right? And, and more importantly, they definitely do not fit in with a narrative of disability rights in general. So the textbook that I use that's the companion to this, it's about um, 650 pages long. Want to guess how many pages are devoted to this issue? Two. 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 And I chose that book mostly because it was the only one that had even two pages that talked about this as opposed to all of the other laws that we've been talking about. So where do people with disabilities end up finding the housing and the support that they need? Who are the people willing to house them, willing to do this care work for free or for the most minimal pay? You guessed it, their families. Most people with intellectual abilities live with their families and not just for the first 18 or 21 years of life. A nationwide survey in 2001 showed um, that 60% of people with intellectual disabilities live with their families. More recent statistics in my own state, Minnesota, in 2017 showed 65%. And living at home is a proxy for having your family provide most of the support you need for the activities of daily living. We all know about the increased caregiving responsibilities assumed by families and parents when schools closed because of the pandemic this past year, right? Um, well, another thing that happened during the pandemic was that a lot of the places where people with disabilities, adults with dis disabilities go during the day, um, closed down. These are supportive environments where there is supported employment opportunities sometimes or therapeutic kinds of things. They shut down. Um, so, you know, where did those people go? Families had to find ways to take care of them during the day. And all those people who lost their jobs during the pandemic, Again, it was left to the hands of the families to find a way to keep them busy, sane, or at the very least safe during the day. Okay, now here's where I would really like to be able to say something uplifting. Like, it's not really all that bad. Here's the ray of sunshine in all of this, but I can't because I have to talk now about how it's getting worse. 
There are two disability law reform initiatives that dramatically illustrate the continued hold of this autonomy ideal in disability rights activism at the expense of those whose lives witness a very different vision of human dignity. One of them has to do with jobs and the other has to do with housing. Now both of these initiatives originate in absolutely legitimate and noble movements to address historic abuses of people with disabilities in horrific institutional settings or in closed workplaces. Our image might be institutions like the Willowbrook State Hospital on Staten Island in New York, which relied on the unpaid labor of residents to fund itself and coop them up in just really horrific conditions. After widely publicized visits by Senator Robert Kennedy in 1965, who he called the place a snake pit, and then a, a dramatic uh, investigative uh, journalistic report by Geraldo Rivera, Rivera in 1975, and a class action lawsuit, Willowbrook finally shut down, and it, was, uh, it cleaned up its act, and it was finally shut down in 1987. But much closer to home, both in time and in distance, is the equally horrific story of Henry's Turkey Services in Adelissa, Iowa where in 2014, an Iowa jury awarded 34 men with intellectual disabilities $240 million for the decades they'd spent living in a decrepit bunkhouse locked up at night so that they could spend their days eviscerating turkeys at a rate of 41 cents an hour. So we still need laws to protect against this sort of exploitation but do we really need to eliminate arrangements that have nothing in common with that kind of exploitation simply because they run counter to an autonomy-based notion of human dignity? Let's talk about work. Over the past decade, there's been a push to close what are called sheltered workshops, places where people with disabilities work in some sort of a closed setting, often at less than minimum wage. There are two aspects to the shelter in that name. There's a physical shelter. They're physically segregated from people without disabilities. And there's a figurative shelter in the exemption they get from our laws that require the payment of minimum wages. It's a legal exemption that lets employers be certified to pay less than minimum wages for people whose earning capacity or productive capacity is impaired by physical or mental deficiency. Now there's constant pressure to totally eliminate that minimum wage exemption. Now let me be clear, I fully support a critical and careful look at situations where employees are being paid less than minimum wage for doing the same work that somebody without a disability is doing. And I fully support efforts to identify people who might be inappropriately segregated in work situations where they could have integrated jobs. There's no justification for the exploitation of a business like Henry's Turkeys. But not everybody with a disability is capable of that kind of work, and not everybody is comfortable or safe in the hullabaloo of, of, of commerce, of the world of commerce, right? And the pressure to recognize only one kind of work as legitimate, noble, and enhancing of the dignity of a person with a disability is having the effect of eliminating work arrangements centered around a really different vision of work. A vision of work is the ongoing participation in God's creation, as having both an objective and a subjective dimension, as having something, some sort of an intrinsic social dimension as well. In 2014, the minimum wage exemption was amended to add a requirement that no one under the age of 25 could be paid a sub-minimum wage unless the state's vocational rehabilitation office, I'll call that the voc rehab people, the voc rehab people had to certify that the person is ineligible or unsuccessful at achieving competitive integrated employment. This concept of competitive integrated employment has become the gold standard for all work with people with disabilities. It's defined as having three attributes. It gets paid at or above minimum wage. It's at a location that's typically found in the community where individuals with disability have the same opportunity to interact with people without disabilities as other people doing those jobs. And it presents uh, opportunities for advancement similar to those available to employees without disabilities in similar positions. That all sounds like a grand idea, but let's think for a minute about this. Where is this housed? Where do you find this regulation? It's found in the domain of each state's voc rehab office, and those offices are governed by the Department of Education, not labor, education. Why does it apply only to people under age 25? 
It's supposed to capture people with disabilities right after they finish their school programs, which typically end at age 21, before they get shunted off into a sheltered workshop. Think about what you have to do to get permission to take a job or to work in a setting that doesn't meet those criteria. Every state runs things differently, but anecdotally in Minnesota, Voc Rehab has to observe you failing at three different situations. That means Voc Rehab has to find three employers who are willing to let you use their site as a testing ground, and you have to try and fail at three different jobs before you are allowed to take a sub-minimum wage job. Just think about what that means for the person with disabilities who has to go through this humiliating and time-consuming certification process. And in the meantime, what does this young person do while they're going through the process? You guessed it, that's left up to the families. And worse, during those crucial years, the young person is prevented from taking part in potentially valuable training and job skills development in a sheltered, more supportive environment that might actually lead to um, offering them a fulfilling and satisfying way to contribute what they can to God's ongoing task of creation. People with disabilities who are not capable of competitive integrated employment are increasingly being left with no options. Settings with the slightest resemblance to a sheltered workshop are being closed by state mandates or by regular, uh, regulatory obstacles or funding issues. Just last week, the Department of Education issued updated guidance on what qualifies as an integrated employment location and explained that typically found in the community rules out any employment setting that was formed for the specific purpose of employing people with disabilities. It also rules out group employment settings like work crews and landscaping crews, unless you can prove that this crew was not put together for the specific purpose of employing people with disabilities. Now, the guidance does say that a person with disabilities has the right to choose to not seek competitive integrated employment, but no VOC rehab funding can support that person's choice. Instead, the VOC Rehab Agency must refer the individual with a disability to other community resources that may be able to assist the individual. When, the federal, when federal agencies issue regulations, they have to publish a draft of the regulation and give the public some time to comment on it. And then, before they issue the final regulation, they have to write an explanation of all of the arguments they heard, uh, how they accommodated them, or why they rejected them. Now, the, that portion of the regulation that came with the final regulations on this minimum wage exemption uh, adjustment was just a textbook case of the blind adherence to the ideals of autonomy. The constant response of the agency to any of these arguments about the detrimental effect this might have on some people with disabilities was simply, yeah, well, the law says that they ought to have this kind of employment. Listen to this, quote, we understand the concerns about the potential loss of needed disability-related and income-based benefits and the availability of sufficient jobs in the community. However, the law embodies the belief that with appropriate skills and supports, all individuals with disabilities can participate in the competitive workforce and achieve self-sufficiency. The act as amended could result in more job opportunities becoming available to individuals with disabilities, including those with the most significant disabilities. That was their answer. But the reality is just wishing for competitive full-wage jobs for all people with disabilities and asserting that it's the ideal does not create those jobs. And if you listened really carefully to that quote, you'll hear another problem. If a person with a disability is too successful at attaining a high paying job, she runs the risk of losing her eligibility for SSI and for the waiver that is probably making it possible for her to live a partly independent life. If that doesn't it demonstrate the utter incoherence of disability law and policy, I don't know what does. So finally, I'll talk a little bit about housing, what's going on with housing. The deinstitutionalization of people with disabilities was the single most important move in the history of disability rights. But it's not enough to close the big institutions. You have to find a place for the people who are liberated to live. And that mostly happens, as I've explained, through Medicaid waivers. The regulations governing these waivers over the last few years are moving in the same direction as the job regulations. This is played out in the definition of what qualifies as a home and community-based setting, an HCB, that's eligible for waiver funding. 
In 2014, when HHS adopted regulations defining an HCB, it got a lot of pressure by disability rights organizations to put strict numerical limits on the number of people with disabilities who could live in such a setting. They wanted it to be limited to not more than four people with disabilities ever living together. HHS resisted that pressure and instead established a set of minimum qualities for an HCB. It can't be segregated from the larger community. It has to ensure that residents are free from restraints, that they have privacy, they have the right to lock their doors, they have the freedom to set their own schedule, to eat whenever they want to, to have visitors. But states are allowed to set a higher threshold for HCB settings than required by that federal regulation and have the, notion, the option of establishing size and occupancy limits, and a lot of them are doing that. And so the pressure, the pressure too is, is insistent and, and heavy on, on federal reg regulations to implement that four-person limit. And what's the practical consequence of this? As, as Carter said, I serve on the board of L'Arche USA, which is the American wing of a worldwide movement started by Jean Vernier, where people with and without disabilities live together in support of faith-based communities. And um, many of these communities are just finding it harder and harder to maintain the sorts of vibrant communal living situations um, that, that they uh, ideally espouse. In face of these regulatory pressures, they can make um, these homes economically unfeasible. And this move is also contrary to what other non-disabled people are increasingly looking for. In Minneapolis, one of the goals of the 2040 comprehensive plan for the next decade is to, quote, remove barriers and support innovative and creative housing options, such as multi-generational housing that supports large family structures, single room occupancy, shared housing, co-housing, and cooperative housing. One of the hot trends in real estate, apparently, especially for you young hipster millennials, is co-living, right? Where five or more adults will live together in a house so they can share expenses and afford to live in high income, uh, in, in, in high priced uh, neighborhoods. All of these movements recognize the reality of mutual dependency. And all of them recognize that for a lot of us, with or without disabilities, the ideal is not living alone by ourselves in an apartment. How ironic that those who are most dependent should be being denied opportunities to live the sorts of lives that those without disabilities are seeking out. So what is to be done? On the strategic level, I think there might be potential legal actions on equal protection grounds as the ramifications of some of these actions continue to play it themselves out in ways that make really dramatically clear the disproportionate impact on people with intellectual disabilities. But the harder question really is who is gonna bring these challenges? If the disability rights community persists in ignoring the realities of dependency that shape the lives of a great percentage of their constituents, who is gonna carry the ball in that fight. It's those who are willing to speak for people who cannot speak for themselves, but there's a real problem with that. In the discourse of disability activism, people who purport to speak for people with disabilities simply have no credibility. The slogan of the disability rights movement is, nothing about us without us. But that's problematic if the us includes a large number of people who are not capable of speaking, let alone advocating for themselves. This is why the topic of this conference and all of those wonderful books is so important. Dependency must not be seen as something to be ignored. It has to be embraced and recognized as something that's integral to our human dignity. How are we going to do that? I do not know. So I'm hoping that Mary is going to have a lot of good ideas for us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for that. <laughs> Excellent analysis, an absolutely impossible task. <laughs> I'm not even sure where to go with that. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm really glad to be here tonight, and um, it's really a privilege to be able to respond to you. Um, 
so I, I, the part of the problem with responding to this paper was there were so many points of discussion, I really had a hard time e even knowing where to start. I'm, I'm gonna make three points and then hopefully we can have a broader, a broader discussion. Um, so first of all, um, it was honestly um, a bit disheartening, but also I think extremely important that you pointed out that in the area of promoting the good of those with cognitive disabilities, uh, we have come nowhere near as far as we like to think. Um, I have long thought that I was premature to declare any victory in this field. Because from my perspective, despite all the legal protections and the strong anti-discriminatory language um, and protect, or language of the ADA, as, as imperfect as they might be, um, still, still, despite all the, these, um, these protections, between 60 and 90 percent of infants with cognitive disabilities are systematically identified and destroyed before birth. With the exception of some recent state bans on this practice, this enjoys full legal protection. It's also become an acceptable arena in which to give voice to strong discriminatory attitudes towards those with cognitive disabilities, such as a case a few years ago when Washington Post editor Ruth Marcus penned an almost gleefully discriminatory piece about why she would have aborted a child with Down syndrome if she had the chance with almost no sanction, right, from the disability community. Advocates notes, note that it has been historically difficult to enforce the federal civil rights law such as the ADA within the area of medical decision making. I think that in the case of the ADA, this partly stems from a fundamental flaw in the disability rights movement which underlies the ADA, and that is that it drew heavily both in language and strategy from the civil rights movement and the women's rights movements without acknowledging a very fundamental difference. Unlike racial groups, for example, individuals with disabilities have characteristics which I think most of us would agree might be better off eliminated. Um, exceptions to this, of course, might include the deaf community. Um, I think there's a growing um, movement within the autism community, sort of a neurodiversity movement. Um, but I think in general, um, this still holds. By ignoring this difference, the disability rights movement utterly failed to erect any safeguards for discrimination, i.e. limit the acceptable types of treatments or cures for disabilities themselves. So for example, portions of the ADA that you just mentioned ensure that a pregnant woman with a cognitive disability would have equal access to prenatal care. But that care is gonna include screening, right, for that same disability in her infant and offering to end her child's life if found and, and, and even um, possibly recommending it strongly. Both the ultimate act of discrimination, right, for that child, but also the perpetuation of the very attitudes meant to be eradicated by the ADA that those with cognitive disabilities cannot live full and meaningful lives. To use your phrase, Lisa, this is utterly incoherent. It also might be worth pointing out that this, this discrimination arises in part from the fact that autonomy is a double-edged sword and it cuts both ways into the lives of those with intellectual disabilities. As you pointed out, Lisa, this population has the most at stake in the autonomy debate because many flat out fail this basic criterion for, for inclusion. But at the same time, these individuals pose the, the biggest threat to our own autonomy. Their dependence, their radical dependence makes claims, makes, makes claims on the rest of us which are unsupportable if we want to live, our, live out our own freedom, right, to live unfettered lives. So in this worldview, it's hard to imagine one more despised than the one who has no autonomy, right, and would threaten to steal our autonomy as well. So I think, you know, that I had always thought there was a discrepancy, perhaps, between the treatment of those with infants with disabilities and those who are adults, but your, your paper make, makes me think that really, no, there, there actually is, um, there is actually a very frightening um, consistency and coherence, really, that, um, that our mistaken view of autonomy really has cut into the lives of those with disabilities, right, at every level, um, at every level and at every age. The second point I wanted to make uh, regards the issue of work and disability. Your analysis of specific regulations um, governing employment and, and housing was detailed and very sobering. 
Um, the issue that seems most pressing to me is the issue of employment, and I think maybe you would agree. It's, it seems that um, it, it's going to affect how um, those with disabilities really spend their days, right, the day-to-day -day life of those with disabilities. And um, especially with, with regards to um, sheltered workshops, uh, minimum wage, I think that's probably, um, probably the most pressing issue. And, and originally I was gonna ask you, Lisa, where these regulations come from because they seem so out of touch with the reality of those with serious cognitive disabilities. And I was gonna say, you know, so out of touch with my own field, right, of intellectual disability. Um, and then I'm so embarrassed to say that when to research it, um, I find that these come, right? I, I think that probably these are very much driven by my own field of intellectual disability. Um, the a 2018 article in the Journal of Intellectual Disability summarizes much of the current thought on sheltered workshops. Um, for example, this article notes that the U.S. government has acknowledged sheltered workshops or segregated day programs as a form of unnecessary segregation. It comes from the U.S. Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. The author also notes that this is kind of interesting. With technology enhancing employee performance across the, the IDD, um, intellectual and developmental disability spectrum, the concept of disability has been reformulated by disability rights advocates to reflect the belief that persons with disabilities are handicapped by societal attitudes and barriers in the environment, not by their impairment, right? How out of touch is that? It totally doesn't reflect the reality um, of those with disabilities. He goes on to quote the, the principal deputy um, assistant attorney general again in the Civil Rights Division in the U.S. Department of Justice who said that when individuals with disabilities spend years, indeed, indeed decades in congregate programs doing so-called jobs like these, um, yet do not learn any real vocational skills, we should not lightly conclude that it is the disability that is a problem. And finally, sheltered workshops can seem to operate from a pre-19th century perspective that understands people with IDD to be incapable of learning and thus not vocationally trainable. So running through these comments, we see a good impulse, right? As you noted, to protect the disabled from abuses, which have been real, but also some very problematic ideas stem stemming from equating disability rights with civil rights, right, from the, with the black civil rights movement, a mistaken notion of autonomy that you mentioned, and all of this against a background that you also mentioned, um, that we really don't have a good conception of work, what, what is work, right, um, for, the, for the person with a serious cognitive disability. So my sense is, um, I don't really have any answers here, my sense is that getting this right um, is going to be very difficult. Um, so I'm curious, I guess I'm gonna toss this one back to you, Lisa. Um, I'm not sure what we're gonna do. This is gonna be a tough fight, but a good one. So finally, I want to respond to your point about the family as bearing the brunt of care for individuals with disabilities. Um, I agree with you entirely on this point, um, in the fact, or the fact that yes, they do. The data is very clear on this, um, but I don't think you'll be just uh, surprised to hear that um, I propose a very different lens um, from which to view this. As a starting point, I would offer that it be considered a good that the family bears primary responsibility for the care of those with intellectual disabilities. From my perspective in prenatal diagnosis, the majority of families, if given a chance, would absolutely sever right, that tie with their child with a cognitive disability. Um, and as you stated, as recently as 50 or 60 years ago, um, we know that those with cognitive disabilities were placed in institutions. I had a, a cousin with Down syndrome, a beautiful little girl, a few years older than me named Cornelia, who was institutionalized at birth, and her fate has haunted me uh, since my own son was born with Down syndrome. I would be out holding him uh, late at night and, and wondering who was doing that for her. So against this backdrop, I would say the fact that those with cognitive disabilities are largely in the care of families is probably the most hopeful feature of the disabilities landscape right now. Um, because no matter how difficult or exhausting or messy or imperfect, um, stressful, and perhaps even inadequate this care might seem, it is fully consonant with our human dignity as dependent relational beings. Not rational, this isn't rational at all what we're doing, but relational. Um, uh, fully consistent certainly with, with the dignity of, of those with, the, um, with, with, with cognitive disabilities. Um, their dependence, as you know, go, goes um, far beyond the need for physical um, help and support. Um, they're, 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 uh, dependence um, really um, calls for human communion and what better place to meet this than um, where uh, Pope St. John Paul II called the intimate community of life and love that is the family.
Um, the situation is also consistent with the dignity, the full human dignity of the other members of the family. As I mentioned, autonomy cuts both ways, and it can be really hard for us to shake the uh, pervasive lie that our lives are meant for ourselves alone. Anyone who has assumed full care for a child or sibling with significant cognitive disability cannot escape living out the truth that our lives are given to be poured out for another. Um, that he who gives his life for his brother, and I'm looking at you, Danny, my son's here, um, will save it. That true happiness, and in fact, our very salvation lies in doing not our will, right, but the will of another. Uh, there is another role, too, which I think is often the province of the family with regards to human dignity. And this is a task of translating, if you will, the dignity of the member with a cognitive disability for others to see. Um, I, I don't think it's false to say that the full beauty of individuals with serious cognitive disabilities is often disguised, is often difficult to see. I have a um, colleague, excuse me, I'm just going to look, drink of water. I have a colleague who works with infants with very severe congenital malformations, and as she gently puts it, these infants are difficult to meet. She often helps to prepare visitors to enter the hospital room and to alleviate any discomfort. She says, if you don't know how to react to the baby, just watch the mom, because she'll be looking at the baby the way God sees him. To quote John Paul again, here it's a matter of God's own love of whose parents, of, excuse me, of which parents are co-workers and as it were interpreters, right? We interpret, we translate God's love um, for that child. So families don't confer dignity on the individual with a disability, but they can reveal it, right? And not just through their glances, I think, but through the witness of their sacrificial life, um, love for their child, through entirely laying down their life for this child. So I would start with the fact of families' extensive involvement is a good thing, um, but obviously, Lisa, I mean, we can't end there. Um, we can't say to families, okay, so good luck to you, right, in this, in, in this endeavor. Even families with many resources are gonna have difficulty providing everything an individual with cognitive disabilities needs, meaningful work and training, social opportunities, and with regards to housing, frankly, you know, sometimes children with, um, adult children with cognitive disabilities don't wanna live in their parents' basements forever. Um, or maybe they need round the clock care, or um, parents simply age out, right, of care for their children, which happens all the time. Um, and so where should families look for the extra support they need? I think that, Lisa, you made an absolutely compelling case um, uh, for challenging the state to provide policies, programming, and funding that's consistent with the true dignity of those with disabilities. In closing, though, I want to leave you all um, with a final thought, maybe um, a bit of a challenge. Lisa's work is well suited to calling the state to task, right? That's what you do well. Um, my work leads me to call families up to the plate. That, that's what I spend my time doing. But frankly, um, I would say that you all are not off the hook either um, because neither of these is wholly adequate, right? So, so consider this. Um, the social networks of those with intellectual disabilities are small and dense. Uh, one study, for example, suggested that immediate family members and paid caregivers uh, com comprise 80% right, of their supports. So let, let's say that paid caregivers represent the state's help, for example, um, because most, m most of them are uh, supported by the waivers that you mentioned. Um, this paints a pretty bleak picture. Um, it's okay to have a small social network, you know, contrary to what Facebook would have you um, believe. You don't need 400 friends. But the lack of diversity of those individuals with cognitive disabilities means that if something happens to immediate family members, who's left, right? Paid workers, right? Supported by the state. Um, so no amount of state funding can adequ adequately provide for the kind of human communion that's consistent with the view of human dignity that I think we all espouse here, that we artic are trying to articulate. The family stepping up as best they can, I think. Um, they have to, no choice. The state has an important, but I still think somewhat limited role. So where is everybody else in this picture? You know, neighbors? I don't know, friends? Extended family members? Cousins, right? I'll take anybody, honestly. Um, most notably, right, the most notable absence, I think you'd agree with me, Lisa, where's the church? I don't know, where's the church? I am not seeing the church in the research, right, as a social support. Um, so anyway, I guess I'm challenging all of you. Um, Lisa and I would love company.
anybody want to join us, you know, you want to lie down your lives with us, we would be happy to have you. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's I just want to thank Mary for everything she did. First of all, giving me a more positive lens to be looking at this thing that has been consuming me as I write this and making me angrier and angrier. She's absolutely right. I mean, I, I, she, you, you may not know, you know that, that Mary has a son with a disability, and I, I do too, and an adult son, and I, was, I grew up with a, a, a brother with disabilities, and um, they're both... A, biggest blessings in our combined families' lives, but they are worries and burdens, and um, we're, the demographic that Mary mentioned of, of, of caregivers aging out is affecting us dramatically. There's a population right now, the greatest generation is all dying, right? And the greatest generation was having people, children with disabilities, at a time when they were being, starting to think that they didn't have to institutionalize them, that they could take care of them themselves. And the greatest generation didn't believe in any of these public supports. So like my brother, he was able to get a job, he paid taxes, he had a minimum wage job, washing dishes his entire career, and he lived with my parents. And then my parents died, and he's outside of the system, and he's in Pennsylvania where the waiting list is like forever. So all of a sudden, it's just a, a burden that we didn't expect, and that's a huge demographic crisis that people should be thinking about. One quick little thing about uh, one of the points that you made, which is that I, I agree there is a real problem with the fact that the disability rights movement was um, modeled on civil rights legislation. There's so much of that that's really powerful and good, but there was a but, but there's so much of it that's just wrong that doesn't fit. And and there was a there's a there was a woman who's a disability rights activist named Adrian Ash, and she she was a philosopher, and she she was blind, and she was one of the few people to start trying to argue, not from a Catholic perspective, but from a, a, a perspective of, 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 of philosophy, that um, disability-based abortions are wrong. And she was trying to articulate arguments for that. And she was trying to make the argument that there's, you know, being of a different race isn't inherently bad. Being a woman isn't inherently bad, but it, it is a reality that having a disability is not a good thing. You can make you you can make you know you can make sunshine out of it, but it's not a good thing. And so and so it, there's just a real difference there. But to, trying to get that into the discourse is really hard. And um, I've been trying to make some of these points in secular kind of conferences, trying to find vocabulary. But the minute that somebody hears that you're a parent of somebody with a disability, you get shut down. Because you're not, you're not one of us. You're not. You're just. You're. You're always going to be infantilizing your person, and there's nothing you can do about it. So these are a couple of my thoughts in reaction to Mary's wonderful, wonderful remarks. Mary, do you want to say anything else? Thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy to be open to questions. Okay, great. Let's uh, let's open the floor to questions. This is an extraordinary. Please come up to the um, microphones and uh, tell us your name and and where you're from, and then ask your question. We'll start over here. Hello, my name is Teresa Hanish. I am from the University of St. Thomas, so really close to you. Um, I am wondering what the answer to Mariel Callahan's last question was, is where is the church? And since you both have family members with disabilities, what would be your dream response to see from the Catholic Church? Yeah, could you hold the mic? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, um, my perspective, the work, the work I do. So I um, work very hard on calling parents, right, to accept their children into the, um, the domestic church, right, into the family, which is a domestic church. But the same parents, right, um, and, and the, church, the church itself is very good on this, on, on the question of disability selective abortion, of course, right? Um, absolutely, absolutely supports um, parents 
carrying their children to term and, and, and bringing them into the family, the domestic church. But these same families, right, when they approach the larger church for help for catechesis initially, um, baptism's not so much a problem, right? <laughs> there's, there's not a lot of requirements there. But for catechesis, which requires um, a certain commitment uh, on the church to, to provide a specialized catechesis um, for the sacraments, et cetera. Um, but most notable, noticeably, at least in this country, because this is a, a large part of parish life for us, the Catholic schools, um, uh, it, it's absolutely, um, it, it's, it's very rare um, for, for children to be allowed into the Catholic school. Um, and most Catholic schools, if they say they provide um, special education, they typically mean they have children with um, IEPs, so, some kind of individualized education plan, um, but certainly not the kind of, of disabilities, um, I think, like our sons who might need um, more supported care. Um, so. I guess I would um, really like to see children in Catholic education. Um, I think that's so important, and I think it's um, I think it's important not for our, simply for our children, right, who um, absolutely deserve um, a faith-based education. Um, but I think it's crucial for the entire church. I think it's crucial for the rest of children in the school um, to to have exposure to, to children like ours. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with. With everything that, that Mary said, um, and I had a striking experience once. A young couple, very, very Catholic, had um, um, grown up in Catholic schools all their lives, had a child with Down syndrome, and when I visited them, they said, we've never known anybody with Down syndrome. That couldn't be true if you live, went to public schools, but it is often, it can be true if you've gone to Catholic schools. I would also say, just on the parish level, you want my wish list? Okay, when you have a kid with a disability and you want to sign them from special ed, don't tell the parents they have to do it. Because nobody that's a volunteer is going to be not as scared as you are. Um, that's number one. Number two, confirmation. Great opportunities for all kinds of service hours for everybody else in the confirmation class. Don't tell the parents that they have to do their own little special confirmation training. Number three, adults with disabilities everything drops off. When school ends, when they're 21, they lose friends, they lose social opportunities, they lose sports, they lose everything. So parishes that could put together young adult programs for people with disabilities, social programs, not just segregated, but invite them to your, um, to your, to your, to your parties, to your dances, and, and can be companions to them, be friends to them, and volunteer to take them places. Um, it, Mary's story about, you know, Needing people, I just, I'm desperate to get somebody to take my son somewhere on Saturdays every once in a while, you know, and I keep asking my son as a youth minister, don't you have some teenagers who could do this, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. haven't been had any success yet. And then finally, um, like parishes, I think parishes should be reaching out to every group home or, or facility in their area and asking if there are any Catholics there who need transportation to mass, because that's not happening. And if their paid aides don't want to take them to mass, they don't get to go. So those are some of my concrete suggestions. Over here. Uh, my name is Leah Sargent. I write the other feminism substack focused on the dignity of dependence. And this is also a wish list question because your, both of your remarks reminded me of the writing of Father Jean Daniel Liu who wrote Prayer is a Political Problem and said that part of the way the state can get in the way of a full religious life isn't an active hostility, but a false neutrality that doesn't give people the support they need to live a full spiritual life as much as we need a full life of work or a family. And in your talks, I hear that same lack of support for families that are making heroic sacrifices for what shouldn't be quite that level of heroism. It should be easier to care for the people you love. So I'm wondering, what can the state do to better support what you've described, Mary, is the natural choice to, to care for the child you love. Uh, but that kind of feels like it's treated as a neutral choice or a choice among other choices and it isn't given the weight of support it needs for it to feel like the natural choice. Well, a, a couple of things. I mean, there are these um, you know, things that are built into that whole waiver system. Um, parents ca can get paid to do some of the care work, um, and siblings can get paid, and that's all really good, but they're still treated as second class, and maybe there should be a recognition that that kind of work should be paid even, even more than if it's a professional. 
because it's somebody who <coughs> knows the, the person so intimately. Um, but yeah, that, there's all these other weird little incentives. Um, for example, um, um, just uh, priority in getting COVID vaccines. Um, that happened through people who were paid to take care of my kids. They got priority. And because some of my other kids, they do get paid to do things with my son, they got priority too, which is good. But I didn't get any priority. You know, I mean, so recognizing in, in just all these facets of things, the, the, the caregiving work of, of, of family members is doing, is frontline work and should be valued as such, I think is really important. And a recognition that, you know, the, the strides that we make on, on family leave and, 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 and things that are being extended a bit to um, uh, support the recognition of the necessi necessity for elder care. And I would like that to be extended too, to uh, support the recognition of life, you know, lifelong care responsibilities that people might have. Great. Yes, tell us your name. I'm Claire Marie Patris, also from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. Um, I'm overjoyed that we're addressing this issue, so thank you for speaking. Um, my question is in regards to cures. Um, keeping in mind that individuals with disabilities provide so much value and perspective to society that those of us without disabilities, frankly, cannot. Um, are cures something that we should be pursuing at all? Um, and if so, where's the line there? Um, yeah, I'd just be curious to know your thoughts on that. No, that, that's an excellent question, and it's one that I've been asked a lot. Um, but I say absolutely. And my, uh, my sort of mentor, although he, he is long, he's, 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 he's not alive anymore, um, at least sort of for thinking about this, is um, uh, uh, Jean, not, not Lavier. I'm blanking. Jerome Lejeune. Jerome Lejeune. Jerome Lejeune. Um, because he was absolutely convinced, right? He, I don't know, I'm assuming you're, you're familiar with Jerome Lejeune, um, but his cause is up for canonization. Um, he discovered the um, genetic basis for um, Down syndrome and then spent the le rest of his life, right, trying to cure it. Um, and obviously part of his motivation for curing it was that he realized the discovery he had made was going to be used for um, for finding and, and then destroying these children. Um, but he also, he was just convinced. He, he was convinced that in order to save these children, um, we needed to cure them. Um, and so I, I've always, um, I, I have um, really sort of followed um, his model, I think. Um, you know, it, it, with experience with my own son, you know, um, it, it's a difficult question because that extra chromosome, right, is in every cell of his body. So it affects the way he looks, the way he talks, the way he, he sleeps, the way he breathes, I mean, everything about him. So I don't even know what a cure for him would look like. I don't know what it means to say, you know, he would be cured. But at the same time, I would give him better help if I could. Um, you know, he, he um, has a feeding tube, he has a G-tube, he, um, he has um, hearing problems, he has visual problems, he ha uh, was born blind in one eye, um, he has serious learning problems. I think, I think that Down syndrome makes children more susceptible to autism. He's got autism, which causes um, serious behavioral problems. Um, he really struggles in every aspect of his life. I mean, I love him so much. Um, I don't know, it, it seems to be selfish um, just to say that I don't want him cured. But again, I don't even know what that means, to be frank. So I understand it's a very complicated question. Um, but I think, you know, um, I have a, a friend who, um, uh, her husband went to Notre Dame. She's a physician. She was actually the one who started all of the cognitive research on Down syndrome. She's an amazing woman. Um, and she, you know, she puts it this way because people challenge her in the same way because she was looking for cognitive cures. She says, well, look, you know, if your child with Down syndrome, like they have an eye problem, right? Right, you, you get glasses. Their heart is a hole in it. You get the heart fixed. Um, but we tend to, when, when children have cognitive issues, we tend to, I don't know, tend to attach some sort of strange magical importance, right, to the, to the brain, as though that's not an organ like everything else, right? And, and we understand it at lesser degrees. Like if your child has a learning disability, you, you certainly go and you pursue getting that uh, fixed. But, but if they have such a significant cognitive um, you know, delay or, or cognitive problem like Down syndrome, we're sort of afraid, right, that somehow, I don't know, maybe we're going to be um, changing the very, the very locus of, of, of personality there. Um, but, but she's very good at, uh, at this. She said, you know what, the brain is an organ like any other organ, so what, what's wrong with you know, um, helping that child to, to, um, to have better thinking, et cetera? Anyway, 
That's my answer. I don't know if you agree, Lisa. I absolutely agree. I have nothing more to add to that. <laughs> it, it captures all the ambivalence and the complicated nature of that question. But I, I agree with you 100% with everything you said. And in the interest of time, this will be our last question. Please tell us your name and uh, your, where you're from. Um, thank you both so much for speaking. My name is Chaley Haig. I'm from Benedictine College. Um, I thought your lens was really beautiful on how um, children and adults with disabilities should ideally be with their families. Um, and I have a 10-month-old brother who has Down syndrome. Um, and he's the greatest gift to our family. Um, and I know that we're all we're going to have to um, make a lot of sacrifices for him. So I'm wondering if you have um, advice, both of you, for um, with having sons with disabilities, um, advice on how families can share the sacrifice so that you don't ever look at that person as a burden? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can give you, I don't know if I have good advice, but I can give you my own experience. I, I don't, want to, don't want to put him on the spot, but like I said, I've got my son here, who, his brother, but honestly, I would say, and I don't want to embarrass him, but I don't feel like we, and I, my husband's here too, you could ask him, but I, I don't feel that we've had to do anything special, frankly. I feel like my kids stepped up, and instinctively they knew. Um, you know, Danny, um, again, I don't want to embarrass him, but he was always so incredibly good with his little brother. Um, he just had an instinctive sense, right, that he was different. Um, when he was small, once I dressed them alike, and I, um, and I said, gosh, you, you look just like, you and Tommy look just alike, and he looked at me, he's like, oh, Mom, he said, you know what, we don't look alike. And I thought, oh no, he's gonna re realize that his brother's features are different. He's like, Tommy's just so much cuter than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I feel like um, when my, I had another daughter who's very small, which is very small, my son had a feeding tube. And you know, um, I think we, my husband and I were out of the country um, together, my parents were there, and, and they, they said my daughter, you know, she would come into a room, she would just assess what he needed, he would you know, pick him up. Um, feed him via his G-tube, give him a bath. I, I don't know, there, there was something about him that just called them, called something out of them that was very good. And my husband and I say, you know, we are not responsible for the characteristics of our children. Um, I feel like our son called something out of them um, that we couldn't have ever given them. And I think that it's interesting because the data bears this out. Children um, who have siblings um, with Down syndrome, they, they tend to grow up and um, they go into caregiving fields. They're more compassionate, um, they're kinder. Um, and honestly, I don't think there's anything specific that their parents did. I think it's just a simple fact of having to live with a child with a disability. I think it's having, um, it's a sacrifice to put somebody else first. Um, all, the, all the other, um, uh, kids in the neighborhood, you know, they, they, they walk to my son, and he's just kind. He's kind um, to them, and, and I think this comes from living with his brother. So, I, I don't know. I agree with that, too. I think that, I think that what happens, um, too, is that you, you, you grow up, when you're a sibling of a, of a kid, of a person with a disability, you just grow up loving somebody. From the minute, either, before, you know, if they were born first, before you were born, you grew up and you knew this was a person that you loved, and then if they came, you knew it was somebody you loved, and their vulnerability makes them even cuter than most, but you have the rare privilege and gift of already loving somebody who is so vulnerable. I think it shapes you, it changes you. Um, there's a, there's, um, Stanley Harawas has just written so many beautiful things about this topic, and he has an essay in, in exchange. There's a there's an exchange in a in a series, a, a book with a bunch of essays going back and forth between him and Michael Barabe, who is an um, English professor and has a son with Down syndrome and has written some great things. But is, um, it, you know, it, it, in one part of the exchange there. They're kind of going back and forth about, you know, well, he, Michael Barabay says if his, he and his wife had known that they were going to have a son with Down syndrome and they knew what it was going to be, they probably would have aborted him and they're, you know, firm that that should be something there. But, but he's, and he says, and I hear Stanley Harawas, I hear these other people and they give me reasons why not and I just can't intellectually commit to those reasons, but he says, when I'm thinking about that, I just, I just think about this experience I had with my son the other day. I was coming back on a train with him and he, he, just, he just, he was falling asleep and he put his arms around me and he says, Daddy, will you love me forever? And, um, and Barabay says, yes, of course I will. And then he, he says, then I started asking myself, where did that commitment come from? Where does it come from? And he says, I do not know. But thanks to people like Harawas and John Varnier and those people, 
I don't question that anymore. It just is, you know, and, and what Haro West draws from that is, it's, it's the experience of, of loving somebody with this incredible vulnerability that opens your world in different ways and that that creates the commitment that you need. So that's, I mean, one thing I would say for, for you know, people who are lucky enough to have people in their family with disabilities, you, you get this rare, you don't have to like meet somebody as a stranger and try to learn to love them even though they're different. You, you, get, you get entree into what it means to love somebody with disabilities and you just get this, Maybe, like, I think you referenced this, this little little kind of glimpse of what maybe sometimes God thinks when he thinks about why he loves all of us. Um, and that's, that's, that's pretty special. Well, on that note, please, everyone, join me again in thanking our amazing <laughs>